Um, good evening. Um, it's getting a little bit late, and I'm sure some kids are going wanting to go to bed soon. But we're going to talk about a particular passion of mine, which is senior horses. Um, I tend to acquire horses and not get rid of them, and as such, I have ended up with quite a few senior horses, um, and still have many of of them. Um, and a senior horse is not necessarily a retired horse either. Uh, some of them are still being used for various purposes. It might just not be the one that they originally started out with. Um, so we're going to start with a little game called Myth or Fact. Um, and so I'm just going to say a statement and we'll try and decide if it's a myth or a fact. So the first one is that my senior horse will be happier living kicked out to pasture than it will be con um, continuing to be ridden. Yeah. yeah, definitely a myth. So there's lots of horses that for whatever reason need to be um, retired from riding, but there's quite a few horses that are still very happy to be ridden and some that even need that um, to keep their mind busy or they just get themselves into trouble in the pasture. Um, it just might not be the same competitive riding that they've done in their younger years. So the next one is, my senior horse still needs the regular fairy care, annual checkups, and vaccines and dental care. Yeah, uh, regular care is gonna help ensure that any problems that come up, which tend to come up quickly and more often in older horses, that they're caught early um, and can be dealt with sooner before they become um, a quality of life issue in that horse. Uh, the next one is, now that we've got a senior horse, they can have whatever and as much as they will eat for their diet. <laughs> Let's kick them out to pasture and let them eat all that grass, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, and that's something we're definitely going to touch on tonight. Um, senior horses need just as much attention to their diet, if not more than a younger horse. Um, and that's whether they are skinny old horses or fat happy pasture horses. And then the last one is, um, my horse has never worn a blanket, so why would they need one now? What do you think? Yeah, so there are quite a few older horses that will continue to grow a great coat um, and do really well through the winters, but as they get older, they might not be able to keep themselves as warm as they used to when they were younger. Um, and also, a lot of them have more trouble they're using their energy for other things and can't put as much energy into staying warm as they used to. All right, so now we'll get into a bit more about the senior horse. So our senior horses now are living quite a bit later, um, late 20s, 30s, and even some that are into their 40s. Um, and we don't really set a senior by a defined age. Some people kind of say, well, it's 18, so maybe it's becoming a senior, but and there can be an 18-year-old and there can be a 24-year-old and they're sort of at the same level of life. It's quite individualized. But generally by the time they're in their late teens to early 20s, we're starting to think about and see senior problems. <coughs> and age itself is not a disease, but as you age, there's a toll that's taken on the body. <laughs> I can't speak to the writer. <laughs> so some of the age-related changes we see in the senior horse are the decreased gastrointestinal function, a decreased immune system function, hormonal changes and diseases, some of those we'll touch on later on, um, arthritis and decreased mobility, decreased resilience to environmental factors such as the cold or wet, um, and then just a generalized aging of their organ system. So their internal organs are just starting to break down. Um, some of the topics that we're going to cover tonight, um, as sort of indicated by our method fact game, are weight control and feeding, winter care, herd and housing management, and uh, common old horse diseases. And really and truly, quality of life in the older horse is really the ultimate goal. In your younger horse, you might be looking at soundness and performance, but once they get a little bit older, we're just trying to give them a good quality of life. Um, and then at the end of that, we're going to touch a bit on the end of life decisions and how it relates to their quality of life. Uh, so in the, when we're talking about quality of life, there's a few questions that we can ask ourselves. And these are going to be quite personalized between you and your horse. So something to think about is, is my horse content? Are they pain-free or can we manage their pain? Because there's a difference between those two. 
Um, and can you manage other diseases that your horse might have? And it can be really difficult to decide if our old horse has a good quality of life. Um, and what you think of as a good quality of life for your horse might not be what somebody else thinks of as a good quality of life for their horse. And there are some really good um, resources. The University of Tennessee Knoxville website, they actually have an excellent um, uh, care worker um, type of resources that help you decide and think about these things. And finances play a role as well because horses are quite expensive to keep and feed. And for some people, it's just not a realistic thing for them to hang on to an older horse. So the quality of life of your horse, changes in your horse can be slow and quite subtle, subtle and unrecognizable by yourself. Sometimes having somebody else to look at your horse, whether it's a friend or a quality of life exam by your veterinarian can really make a big difference. Um, and quality of life exams by your vet, they can help to manage ongoing conditions and help you think about whether they're progressing too much and also help to notice and assess new, condi uh, new conditions. <coughs> And then I'm gonna do my little plug here because we have our Golden Oldie Wellness Package and so we actually do offer um, in-clinic quality of life exams um, and they, you can have as many as you need for your horse throughout the year. So we'll start with routine care. Um, so they still need their regular farrier care, their vaccinations and deworming. Fairy care we still recommend every six to eight weeks, or if they have some of those ongoing conditions like Kirby had talked about in her, her talk, they might need more frequent uh, hoof care even than that. We still recommend that they get their annual vaccines, and that's like any younger horse dependent on their lifestyle. If you've got them at home and they're not going anywhere and no one even hurts going in and out, then their core vaccines will probably be enough. But if you're still boarding your horse out, um, at a busy boarding facility, then we're looking at more vaccines than, than just the, the basics. Um, and then deworming, we still recommend our senior horses follow the same basic deworming protocols as we do for the rest of them. And another thing of, about routine care that sometimes gets forgotten about when we've got our senior horses kicked out to pasture is grooming. Um, and that really helps you have a good look at your horse, you know, a couple of times a week if you can go out and groom them. Then you've got your hands on your horse and you can, you can notice if anything's going wrong rather than sort of walking out to the pasture, giving them a carrot and a pat and, and then heading home because it's cold out. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is feeding and we'll start with feeding for weight gain, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, I've got old thoroughbreds. <laughs> um, so, there's a lot of different options now for feeding your older horse to try and get it to gain weight. We've got specialized feeds, um, for example, the Step 6 and the Step 8 feeds are really good options. Those are senior feeds and high fat feeds. Um, and if your horse is getting to the end of its lifespan of its teeth as well, you can soak those feeds and they soak up really well, making them easily digestible. They're specially formulated for, for seniors. Um, and then we still recommend complete oral exams because sometimes your horse is losing weight not necessarily just because it's getting older but because it's got a sore tooth that's causing it a lot of problems and you get that tooth pulled and it, the horse feels quite a bit, quite a bit better. Um, and then assessment of underlying diseases, maybe there's something else going on that will show up on blood work and help you assess your horse and help you feed it better to help it gain weight. A uh, general rule about feeding horses is we really like to kind of pile on the grains for the, the old skinny horse, but you don't really want to feed it much more than what it can eat in 45 minutes. So if it's not finishing its grain in 45 minutes, it's probably getting bored and full. So if you can split those feedings into more, um, spread them out through the day so they're getting fed a couple of times a day, that's, that's better than um, trying to get them eat two huge bucketfuls of cubes and senior feed. And then if your old horse is losing weight where maybe it hasn't before, think about those underlying disease processes and, and have them checked out before just shoveling on more food. And then just as important for some senior horses is feeding for weight loss. So you don't want to just cut your old horse off of the food or any horse that you've got that's overweight off of food. If you do have an overweight horse, 
Um, you want to decrease their feed slowly until you're feeding about one and a half to two percent of their ideal body weight. So for an average horse that's about a thousand pounds, that's going to be 15 to 20 pounds of food total, which should mostly be forage um, per day. And diseases such as um, equine metabolic syndrome and laminitis and Cushing's and arthritis, those all are better for the horse if they can be at a more appropriate um, body weight. Um, other things to think about when you're trying to help your horse lose weight is to avoid high fat and high sugar feeds. Um, so the feeds that I was talking about in the previous slide for your skinny horse should be avoided in these horses. Uh, there is the odd horse that still needs some sort of supplementation and there's actually a lot of great uh, low sugar, low fat type of feeds for them. Um, and also using hay nets to slow that down their feeding so they're not bored because they're not eating all the time or grazing muzzles. Um, sometimes, it, you know, you've got the old horse with laminitis, it's really not ideal to keep them on pasture and it's, it's a highly unregulated source of sugars for a horse to be on pasture. Um, so muzzles are great to help slow down those guys that are eating too much pasture, but we also have to keep in mind that it's not a very good um, means of dieting to have the horse on pasture, although it's sometimes not practical to have anything else uh, done. And when you, if you do have to manage your overweight horse on pasture, it's actually the shorter grasses that have more sugar because the sugar is short stored in the bottom couple inches of the grass. Um, so a muzzle actually in a bit of um, taller but not good pasture is, is better. And then the sugar content decreases overnight, so grazing them overnight is better than in the middle of the day. Um, and if you are interested in weighing your horse's feed, because that's really the best way to help to regulate what they're intaking, a fish scale and a hay net is a great way to do it. So now we've talked a little bit about trying to, fig to help your horse either lose or gain weight. So how do you know if your horse needs to lose or gain weight? It's easy when your horse is really obese or really skinny, um, but sometimes it's tough to tell. So I'll just briefly go over body condition scoring, which I'm sure many of you know about. We actually have sheets in the back um, that go over the body condition scoring, and this is a great tool along with weight tapes to help us figure out how um, fat our horses are or skinny. So it's a somewhat objective scale to measure a horse's store level of fat, although it does change a little bit between people. Um, and it's definitely important for the reasons we talked about, because horses at either end of the scale, too fat or too skinny, are, are at risk for various diseases. And it really helps you monitor the progress you're making in either helping your horse gain or lose weight. So there's six different points that we look at um, when we're body condition scoring. So we look at um, along their neck, and I did have a pointer around here somewhere. So we're looking along their neck, over their withers, along their back, over their tail head, their ribs, and behind their shoulder. And you can actually, this scale is all over the internet if you're, if you're looking for it as well. Um, so I'll just go through just three um, different body condition scores, one at each end of the scale. And we do it on a scale of one to nine, with one being emaciated, nine being extremely obese. They say that five is your ideal, but if you've got a, an in-shape racing thoroughbred, he's probably at a nine, or a four, sorry. If you've got, you know, your happy-go-lucky trail horse, it's probably a little closer to a six. So in that four to six range is really what's ideal. So if we've got a poor con body condition score, it's emaciated. Um, I, you could be at the back of the room and count every rib. Um, and then they've got prominent bones everywhere and minimal fat coverage. Um, so you can see there's no fat behind its shoulder, there's no fat over its ribs, nothing along its back or neck. So all of those points that we had talked about in the, ne in the previous slide. Um, next we'll go to the moderate body condition score. So again, that's what they call ideal, five out of nine. So you can't see the ribs or the spine, but if you were to run your hands along the side of this horse, you'd probably, you should be able to feel every rib really easily. There's no crest to its neck yet. Its back is nice and flat um, and rounded with nice fat and muscle coverage all over. And there's no fat pad behind its shoulder yet. And then if you were gonna go 
to the opposite end of the scale, you've got extremely fat. So this horse has excessive fat everywhere, all around its body. You probably would have to dig in really hard to find its ribs. Um, and they have a crusty neck. So you can see its neck should probably be about here and all this along the top is excess fat. You can see right here there's a big fat pad behind its shoulder. And if you were to look down the back, it's probably got a bit of a rain trough going down the back, so it's got a crease. And then over its tail head, there's excess fat there and it's bulging out. So that horse would be on a weight loss program. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is blanketing. So like I said before, blank older horses need more attention to blanketing than previously. They tend to have less fat and muscle than they did in their younger years and may or may not have a poor hair coat. Um, most commonly we're blanketing through the winter, but it also gets really cold when it rains, so sometimes a good rain sheet through the spring and summer is just as important as a good uh, winter blanket to keep them from getting soaked through and shivering. And one thing that's really important when your horse is wearing a blanket is to stay hands-on. So taking that blanket off at least once a week and putting your hands on the horse, because when they've got a fuzzy winter coat, they can look pretty fat, but if you get your hands on them, they might be a lot skinnier than you thought they were, or vice versa, they might be a lot fatter than you thought they were. And checking underneath um, their blanket at least once a week will also help you look for anything that's going on. Maybe they developed a fungus under there that you wouldn't have noticed, or maybe they've got a wound that you haven't noticed. So at least once a week taking that blanket off um, and having a good, good check on them. <clears throat> so our next topic is sort of one of the most important ones and helps us bring everything together really. It's their herd and housing management. And I've got a few things to think about, but really they're all intertwined. So when you've got your horse out, maybe it lived forever in a box stall and paddock and now you've decided that you can't quite afford that anymore for the horse that you're just trail riding once a week and you want to stick him out into the pasture. Um, some horses do great doing that and some horses really want their old life back. So <laughs> there's lots of things to think about um, when you're changing the, the living conditions of your older horse. And what's something that's really important is pecking order. So your horse that might have been at the top of the pecking order at, when it was younger might be moving down just because it can't fight its way at the top anymore. So putting it with either um, calmer horses or less playful horses or horses that maybe um, are towards the bottom of the pecking order might be better. It's, it's all about finding those compatible herd mates. Your older horse might not have the same mobility, hearing, and eyesight that it used to. So maybe as a younger horse, you know, it ran around on 80 acres and drank out of the pond that was down at the bottom of the hill. But now that it's got some arthritis, it's really hard to get down that hill to the pond for drinking. And so in the winter, it's not going down there. Um, or maybe um, he used to be a quite independent horse, but now he's losing his eyesight and hearing and he's having trouble finding his herd mates. Then he might benefit from being in a smaller space than he was previously. Uh, another thing to think about is feed. So it's tough to feed horses that are require different feed. So if you've got a couple of old skinny geriatrics, they're probably better off together than a skinny one and a fat one, especially if the fat one's dominant. It makes it a lot easier um, if you're boarding or if you're managing them on your, on your own to, to feed them appropriately. Pasture train that I've kind of discussed already, it, it both um, connects well with the mobility, hearing, and eyesight. So um, your older horse might prefer a smaller, flatter pasture now that it's a little bit older and can't get around as well. But on the flip side of that, having a little bit of terrain for them to walk up and down will really help them stay mobile and keep their muscles up. So again, it's quite individual for each horse. As horses get older, they also like to have consistency in their herd mates. Um, it becomes tougher on them when you're moving them in and out. So even if you're, you're boarding out somewhere, if they can have one friend that stays fairly constant in their herd, that can be quite helpful for them, especially if they're buddies. And then the last thing is exercise. So your old arthritic horse will probably benefit from being able to move around and not being trapped up in a small pen or a stall all the time. 
That exercise can range from you getting on it still three or four times a week and going and riding it like you used to, because some senior horses are still quite sound and, and happy to do that, or it might be that it's out in the pasture and wandering around following its herd mates around, but at a quite slower pace. So it's quite, you have to really make up an individualized program for your older horse and, and figure out what works for them. So we'll move on to talking about some common old horse diseases. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of different things they can get. Um, but it definitely are, is, covers some of the more common ones that we see. So one of the most common problems that we see in older horses is arthritis. Um, we are working our horses pretty hard and they're living a lot longer. So a lot of our show horses especially have arthritis. Um, it can make it really hard for them to move around the pasture or follow their friends around um, and for accessing food and water, especially, like I said before, if they have to go down a slippery path to get to their water in the winter, they're not going to drink as well. And for most owners, pain is one of the main contributors to their perceived quality of life. So the old horse that has arthritis and isn't moving around is a big reason why we are euthanizing older horses. So if you can manage that arthritis and pain, we'll be able to keep them around with a good quality of life for a little bit longer. So for management of arthritis, um, <clears throat> you might previously have managed all of that when you were showing them with joint injections. It gets a little bit expensive in your old pasture horse and even for a trail horse. Some owners are still really willing to continue on with the joint injections, and as long as you can still get into those joints, um, they can be an excellent way to help manage the pain of the arthritis and the inflammation. Um, for some horses, every once in a while they need a dose of butte, and that really helps pick them up a bit. Um, butte, and now we have the um, Prevacox as well, which we can use for a longer term in older horses, well, in, in any horse. So if, if the Prevacox works well for your horse, then that's a great option. It's really about managing your willingness to consider the benefit of the NSAID versus the risk of the, the side effects that come along with using them. Because like we had talked about before, it's about their quality of life. So if the benefit you're getting from using Butte or Prevacox outweighs your risk um, of them getting gastrointestinal problems or something like that from it, then it's probably better off to use it than not. Other things that some people will like to use are joint supplements and the, the legend injections. And those are quite um, individualized between horses. Some horses seem to really respond well to them and other horses don't. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is dental disease. So as horses age, they're getting, their teeth are also getting to the end of their lifespan. As I'm sure as most of you know, their, their uh, teeth are continually erupting, uh, but eventually there's no more tooth left to erupt. So they have a lot of broken and missing and cupped out teeth, and what's left really needs to be cared for so they can keep eating. Um, and there's a lot of discomfort that comes with um, poor dentition, especially if they're broken or need to come out, and it can make a big difference in your horse to have those broken teeth removed. So at least annual dental care um, is recommended, and sometimes more commonly based on the individual horse if there's severe dental disease. One specific dental disease that we have in horses and older horses, it's called equine odontoclastic tooth resorption hypercementosis. So I'm sure all of you can remember that. And go home and look at your horses and you know call us and let, you, let us know if you've got it. Um, so it's horses mostly older than 15 years old and it's an extremely painful condition. So it basically the incisors are usually the only teeth affected and sometimes the canines. Um, and the tooth roots become inflamed and enlarged and then start to resorb back into the bone. So this is sort of what it looks like. You can see how swollen all around the gums are. Um, for true diagnosis, we need to take dental x-rays um, and have a look at what the bone is doing underneath. And the treatment for this is to pull the incisors or any affected teeth really. And it might be a case of pulling the teeth all at once um, or it might be a case of pulling the most affected ones and then continuing to pull them as more become affected. So most horses are extremely concerned about what happens to their horse if they don't have incisors. Um, they still do fine. They're actually a lot happier without 
that pain and without incisors than continuing to have their incisors and being in excruci excruciating pain. So pulling the teeth is the best option. Um, and actually horses without incisors can still graze. They learn to graze. They might need some supplemental feeding because they, might, they probably aren't grazing as well as they used to with incisors, but they're probably grazing a lot more than they are with really painful incisors. So that's an important part of um, our dental checkup is looking at the incisors and, and checking them. And, and it can be a reason for weight loss or a change in behavior as well, of course, in constant pain from really painful incisors. Um, so the next one we'll talk about is pars pituitary intermediate dysfunction, which is another nice long name for an old horse disease. And most of you probably know it as equine Cushing's. So the most common horse or a sign that we see is the really long curly hair coat, and that's usually what people notice in their horses, and often one of the first um, reasons for us to think about this disease. It's actually um, caused by an overgrowth and overactive pituitary, and this results in increased cortisol in the blood, which is the reason for the, the signs that are associated with it. It also tends to only affect horses that are greater than 15 years old, and it's strongly associated with laminitis, and then hirsutism is the fancy word for the long curly hair coat. Other things that we can see in these horses is um, lethargy, muscle wasting, increased drinking and urination, recurrent infections, um, infertility, narcolepsy, and ab abnormal fat distribution. So a horse with a more advanced case of this um, is easier to spot than one that maybe just has some muscle wasting and isn't quite healing up from infections. So, how do we diagnose this? Um, for diagnosis, we generally do blood tests. So in advanced cases, um, measuring the resting ACTH is what we commonly recommend. recommend. And if that, the ACTH levels are increased, that's quite indicative of Cushing's. Unfortunately, ACTH can be increased in a horse that's just dressed. And it also increases naturally in the fall, so it's not always the perfect indicator. But when levels are really high and with their associated signs, then we can, we can say that it's, the horse has Cushing's. Um, other blood tests that we can do, there's one called an overnight dexamethasone suppression test. And for that test, we take um, a baseline dexamethasone, and then we give the horse dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Um, and in horses with Cushing's, they cannot suppress that dexamethasone, so the, the levels will remain high in the next blood test that we take in the next day. In a normal horse, they'll have suppressed the dexamethasone, and so the levels will be back down to normal. So in horses where we're kind of wavering back and forth, and maybe the ACTH is a little high, but you know, it's September, so maybe that's not a, what the problem is, we, we can recommend this test instead. Um, other blood work we'll do in these horses is a metabolic panel, and that helps us assess um, their insulin levels and leptin levels, and uh, just helps us to further characterize um, their, their Cushing's. Treatment for this is Prescend, um, or Pergolide, and that's the box we've got up here on, on it. Um, and it just helps interrupt the pathway for that increased cortisol. And most horses do extremely well once they are treated on this, and even horses with laminitis will see a very impressive turnaround and then, then um, go back from that. Supportive care is also important, so if your horse has laminitis, we need to support them for the laminitis. If your horse has an overgrown hair coat and it's 30 degrees in the middle of summer, we need to think about clipping them and making sure that they're not overheating from that. Some people like to try the herbal remedies and unfortunately there's been lots that have been tried and they are unsuccessful, so um, really just starting them on the percent is is the way to go. Um, another metabolic disease that we can talk about is the equine metabolic syndrome. Um, and it's the easy keeper type horses. So here we've got, look at all that fat on this guy. So he's got the huge crest, big fat pockets all over his body. He's even got, we call this regional adiposity, which means sort of fat pockets essentially um, all over the place. They're the easy keepers. and. This is usually a younger horse disease, sort of the middle-aged type horses, um, but it can affect them long into their senior years, which is why I put it up there. Um, so these are the guys that you would want on a pretty good weight loss program. 
And we see insulin resistance and laminitis with these horses, um, and we would like to run the same metabolic panel that I talked about with the Cushing's on these horses and make sure that we are able to um, help them with their insulin resistance. So their treatment is largely supportive, supporting um, getting them weight loss, helping them with their laminitis um, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, one drug that we can add in for these types of horses is levothyroxine. Um, that's a supplement to help them with the weight loss, but they already need to be on a well-controlled diet for us to use this drug as it can actually increase their food drive. So it can make them hungrier, but also help them with weight loss if they're actually on a good weight loss program. So that's really the important thing to think about when using this drug. It's not a magic weight loss pill. They need to still be on a well-controlled diet. Um, and the last one that we'll talk about for an old horse disease is cataracts. They're often, and this guy, you can kind of see the glassy appearance to his eye. Um, that's sort of what cataracts look like when they're much more advanced. Um, some cataracts you can't really see until you've done an ortho exam on them, like Crystal was talking about in the pre-purchase. So they're often due to an underlying problem in horses, but they can just be an old age change in the older horses. And they'll actually adjust fairly well to their decreasing eyesight because it's usually fairly gradual, the onset. Um, but if you are noticing your horse is having more trouble moving around or is a little bit spooky on one side, this is something to think about. It might be actually decreasing eyesight and, and something to be, um, something to adjust their lifestyle for. So taking all those things into consideration, we move back to our discussion about their quality of life. So your horse might have some of these problems, it might have all of these problems, it might have none of these problems, but we always go back to our quality of life questions. And then that really leads us into um, end of life decisions. So what do we think about when we think about declining quality of life? Maybe your horse is no longer interested in food or actually unable to eat, even if you're trying to shovel as much soap, sink your feet into it as you can. Maybe they've got a real change in demeanor and they just aren't really happy to be around anymore. And even, you know, when you used to go out there and they'd come running over to you, maybe they're not really interested anymore. They might have unmanageable pain, so you could put them on all the butte in the world and it wouldn't really help them. Or there's other conditions. Managing some of those other conditions that we talked about, for example, cushions can be expensive. Um, and some people just don't have the finances to, um, to pay for that, especially if you've got other horses, maybe a younger horse that's up and coming on the go. So the end of life decision is extremely personal for everybody and for their horse. You're a declining quality of life for one horse, you might be able to change something and then you've managed it and that's fantastic. But for a lot of people, maybe their declining quality of life is just sort of one more nail in the coffin until you, um, until you reach that decision. And a lot of the times, you know, it's a slow decline, and then you say, I don't think it's going to make it through one more winter. And that's when you have to decide whether or not to, to pull the plug. So, again, it's individual, and really taking into consideration opinions, sort of other people that know your horse really well, other people that know you really well, and whether or not you think you can manage um, what they've got and then discussing with your veterinarian what they think. Do they think there's something else that can be tried? Or have we kind of used up all the options and what, where we are is, is where you can get your horse to and, and you have to decide if that's, um, that's okay for you. So now we're gonna go into some real life examples. So I'm gonna start with Kramer and Kathy. So these are a couple of old, two old thoroughbreds that live together. This is Kramer, he's 29. He was a racehorse, a show jumper, a dressage horse, an adventure, and a trail horse, and just generally a great all around guy. And this is Cappy on the other side, he's 25, and he is like a hunter champion, man. He's pretty amazing, but now he's retired. So these guys are up there living together. Kramer has um, cataracts, his Hearing is decreasing, he has arthritis, and he has an annual injury, and there's no telling what it will be. <laughs> <laughs> he used to prefer wounds, he's moved on to injuring his uh, muscles. Um, Cappy, 
He is actually quite sound and could still be ridden, um, except that his owners have moved on to newer horses or younger horses, and um, so he's been retired. He has no incisors left. They were pulled when he was younger. Um, and he also has um, maybe half of his teeth left in his mouth. It's, they, there's new ones being falling out every day. So they live together in about a three acre pasture that's mostly flat. And this works out quite well for them because they both are old thoroughbreds and need a lot of food. So they are being fed twice daily. Um, they get step eight and step six that is soaked, alfalfa cubes, um, and then Kramer, because he's at the bottom of the, between the two of them, and Cabby eats a little faster, we, uh, Kramer also gets corn oil added to his food, just as a supplemental fat, so that we can feed Cabby a little bit more, but Kramer still gets the benefit of the added fats. Um, they're also on Farrier's formula because thoroughbreds do not have great feet, and that seems to be helping them. Um, so, and they're also on free choice, either pasture or um, hay, depending on the season. And they actually um, do really well. Cappy still grazes and eats hay. And then Kramer is on about every other day butte, and that keeps him very comfortable. He just needs a gram or a gram and a half a day. Um, and so the owners have decided that the benefits of him being on a consistent butte regimen to keep him comfortable um, greatly outweigh the risks of it for now. Um, so the next one we'll move to is Moose. Um, he is a 21-year-old Holsteiner thoroughbred cross that used to be an inventor. Um, due to conformational issues and overworked by um, a previous owner, he has excessive um, arthritis in one of his knees. Um, and he almost, because his front feet are so turned in, he almost interferes on both of them. So he was retired due to that. Um, and also he has a bad attitude about being ridden. <laughs> <laughs> So that helped in the decision as well. <coughs> so Moose, he, he remains very, very comfortable on daily Prevacox. Um, Kramer in the previous slide, Prevacox does absolutely nothing for him. You could give him all the Prevacox in the world and he'd still be very sore. Um, now Moose, he is exceptionally overweight. It's tough to see in this picture, but if you were to give him a pat on the shoulder, he would jiggle. Um, and he's on pasture all summer and netted brown bales all winter. So that is not ideal. Um, there's probably a component of the equine metabolic syndrome going on there. Um, and it's probably a little bit hard on its knee for that. However, um, the owners have tried dry lotting him and he becomes exceptionally sour and difficult to deal with. So for his quality of life and the owner's quality of life, um, they have decided that he is going to be fat and happy and on Prevacox at this stage and that the mental well-being for everyone involved um, outweighs, I guess, the, if you could call it his physical quality of life. It's sort of, I mean, you got to work with the, the play a little bit and decide what's going to be right. It's really not an ideal situation for his body. But probably, if he was not just kicked out of pasture, he would have been euthanized already because of a bad attitude. And then the last two that um, we're going to talk about are Starlight and Cheyenne. Um, Starlight is a 19-year-old warm blood thoroughbred cross, and Cheyenne is a 22-year-old quarter horse. Um, Starlight has had a couple of bulls. She's done some jumping and dressage and eventing, and is now um, mostly retired, but a bit of a trail horse, and she um, keeps the young horses in line. She also has Cushing's and arthritis. Cheyenne is like entirely healthy. There's not really anything wrong with him, except that he's a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Starlight is on percent, which has made a huge difference in her. Um, and also, she is still managed with joint injections and the occasional um, bit of butte, depending on if she's been a little bit overworked. But the owners have decided that um, joint injections are still helping her, and so she's going to continue to get them, even though she's largely retired. And then Cheyenne, um, he still needs to be ridden because otherwise he gets a little bit crazy, um, and he really likes to work. So he, still, he used to do a little bit of jumpers, um, and now he mostly is just a happy arena horse. He's not very great on the trails. Um, goes a bit swirly. Um, 
but he loves to work and so he is continuing to be worked, um, even though it's different from the work he used, he used to do. So these are a couple of horses that have, well he doesn't really have any old horse diseases, and she's got several old horse diseases, but they're an example of horses that are still being used and worked and enjoying their, their senior age um, under saddle still. Any questions? Um, that's pretty horse dependent. So Starlight, um, it's her front pasterns, her hawks, and her SI joints that need injecting, and about once a year is good for her. It has always been good for her, and she's been injected for about the last seven or eight years. So, um, but it's really quite dependent on the horse. The other guy, Kramer, he's got arthritis too, but a lot of his joints are fused, so you wouldn't even be able to get in there with a needle, or partially fused, so you wouldn't even be able to get in there with a needle to inject them. Some horses, they'll do great for about a year on joint injections. Other horses are better, they last you in a couple of months, and maybe then you need to um, either think about that there's maybe something else going on, or joint injections might not be, you might not be getting the value for how much you're paying for them to keep an old horse comfortable. Um, and with Starlight, she's still being ridden, so it's her worth it to continue to keep her comfortable like that. Yeah? You have to have that Prevacox uh, prescribed? Yes, Prevacox is a prescription, so we need to see your horse before we can prescribe it. Wait? Lindsay, you might mention the new non historical uh, the Foxy Cat. Meloxicam? Yeah. Um, is another non-steroidal. It's more commonly used in dogs and cats, and I haven't really used it much in horses. Do you? Anyone else? There's a new product just out that's more good for horses. Oh, okay. It was, uh, it was approved uh, quite a while ago in Europe, which has been used quite extensively there. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, in, in horses. Did everyone hear Alyssa? No. Okay, so meloxicam, it's been used for several years in Europe and it's newly um, available here and so it's quite well established established in Europe but we just haven't had a lot of experience with it here yet. Yeah? The um, Procin apparently has a horrible taste to it and the horses keep spinning it out regardless of what you do with it. Um, is there any other way of administering that? So Starlight is my horse and she's extremely picky. So I feed her a couple of treats, wait till she's chewing and shove it up in her cheek, and then I feed her a couple of more treats. <laughs> you have that too, you would say to just get the pillow. Um, shove it further back. <laughs> you can dissolve the pill in water and squirt it in their mouth, and so yeah. that's like and they'll get some of it. Yeah. Yeah. One client who uh, takes a corkscrew and a big crunchy corkscrew the bowl and puts the. Yeah, so you can like screw in the middle of a carrot or an apple or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, but there's a lot of horses that'll still spin it out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we find that it's made a difference in these two. We've tried it on our other horses and it doesn't really seem to make a difference at all. But um, yeah, Cappy has really awful feet, especially um, in the summer. So in the summer we also shoe him um, to help that him out with that. But it also seems to, to make a difference in their hair coat. It's sort of, a, I don't know. <laughs> It seems to help them, so we keep feeding it to them. I don't know if we're just feeding them money or not. <laughs> My comment on that is that if you're going to try it, you have to give it enough time to work. Because if you think about how long it takes that foot to grow out, you're not going to see the effect for like six months. So if you're going to try it, you have to be invested in it to give it enough time to work. So We have used it at Moose Mountain Ranch for some of the horses here, and we have seen results on it. 
Yeah, I agree. It takes a long time for it to work and you gotta be religious about getting it to them. Yeah, and, and we've tried both the Ferris formula and there's like that's one of the actual brands and then there's a few other ones and the as far as we could tell the Ferris formula was the one that actually seemed to make a difference. So it's a little more expensive, but it seemed to be the one that actually helped. Yeah. Uh, we actually had used meloxicam for about a month on a 30-year-old mare. She okay. was very, very stiff and uh, could move. Uh, within the first day, we saw a difference. Second day, she was back to her old self, so we are using it on a daily basis. Um, and we just put it in a little bit of uh, sweet tea. She comes running for it in the morning, actually. So. You mentioned uh, putting blankets on regularly. Blanketing will restrict their hair growth, correct? So what's better to have a, a better uh, coat or a better false coat? Um, that's going to be rather horse dependent. So <laughs> um, I think if you start, if your horse grows a good coat and continues to grow a good coat, there's no harm in not blanketing them. But if there's horses that as they get older, they just sort of, they don't really grow as great of a coat anymore and you start to notice them losing weight. And if you've got an already skinny horse, if they don't have to put as much energy into staying warm, then they can put more energy into getting fatter and hopefully helping them out with other, um, other body processes essentially. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you need to start blanking your horse in September when it starts to you know, dip below 10 just because he's a senior horse. Um, if you start to notice your horse that's you know, shivering a little more than it used to um, when it's the same temperature or whatever, then that's sort of when you want to think about putting a blanket on them or if they've been losing weight or something like that. We have a senior Arabian, we have to blanket all the time, and a senior Morgan, we never do. <laughs> Yeah, so of these horses, um, Cheyenne and Madison or Moose, they don't get blanketed because they're nice and fat and grow. Like, Cheyenne looks like a woolly mammoth by the time it's the end of September. Kramer and Cappy, their coats have slowly been not so great as the year before, and, and they're skinny, so we, we keep them pretty well blanketed. 